Well, good morning. Uh, it, it, well, first things first, um, I, I'm sure a few of you at least would like to know, but the Phillies did indeed sweep the Dodgers. So, five to one uh, score last night. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's Friday already. Uh, I, you know, I think in the beginning of the week, it sort of feels like this week's going to be long and there's lots to do, and then all of a sudden it's Friday. And I just want to say it's been a, it's been a, a privilege uh, and a joy to get to share in this week with you, to get to know some of you. I haven't been able to get to know all of you, but to uh, not only share chapel together, but meals and uh, card games. I learned how to play Spicy Uno this week, so that's always good to learn something new. Uh, of course, Frisbee's been great, and uh, maybe the rain will hold off today. We can get another game in. Uh, I just want to encourage you uh, to make sure that you thank your counselors, our staff, our faculty, uh, our, our directors. You have no idea uh, how much work, stress, prayer, uh, energy it takes to make this happen. And it happens because there's a fantastic team of people who love Christ and who love you uh, and who want to give their, their lives and their energy uh, to help you have this experience. So if God has used someone, your, your faculty, your teacher, your conductor, your counselor, uh, and it, I just let them know that. So this isn't a you have to say thank you thing, right? How many of you have done the uh, forced th- thank you, right? Not that. But just, I'm just encouraging you. If God has used someone, if someone's touched your life, let them know. Uh, it, it means a lot. So I just want to encourage you. And it's a privilege to be part of such an amazing team. Uh, I've known a lot of your a lot of your counselors and faculty for a long time, and it is a blessing to know them, their love for Christ, their passion for the craft that God's given them, but they're also their desire to pour into you and to see God at work in your lives. All of us probably can identify with being misunderstood or wanting to communicate something and wanting someone to get to understand you or to understand what you're trying to communicate, but they just don't seem to get it. How many of you would say, I can identify with that, right? Yeah, it's a common experience. And as much as we think about what it feels like to be misunderstood, to to want so desperately, so passionately to be able to communicate something, to help someone understand something, to grasp it. We want them to get something. Maybe, maybe you'd say, man, I, I have a friend or someone I know that I, they don't know Christ, and I, I really want them, and I've, I've, shared, I've shared my testimony with them, I've shared Jesus with them, I've tried to point them to, but they just don't seem to get it. And, it's, and it's, it's frustrating, it's painful, it's hard, because you want them to be able to experience what you've experienced. You want them, you have tasted that the Lord is good. Right? You have seen that the Lord is good, and you want them to know it. Now, I want you to think about that emotion, that feeling, and then imagine how it feels for God to look down on His creation, the ones that He formed and He made, and to see them consistently reject Him, even though He has made Himself known to them, even though He has demonstrated His chesed to them, even though He sends warnings to them, and all of us, All of us can identify with being warned about something and not what? Not listening. Right? Not listening. And so imagine God's heart. This morning, I want us, in in just the time that we have, to consider an amazing story uh, from a prophet in the Old Testament. His name is Hosea. So if you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to find the book of Hosea. It's the first of what we call the minor prophets. Uh, The minor prophets are not minor because of their unimportance. It's just that their messages, uh, their books, their letter, they they are shorter than the major prophets, but their ministry was not shorter. Their impact, their the importance of their message, no less. And the book of Hosea, uh, it's an extraordinary book, and within it there is an amazing, an incredible picture of God's love and faithfulness to his people, despite despite their unwillingness to reciprocate. You know, one of the passions that I have for you and one of the prayers that I have for you is that your heart would both resonate with God's love, that, it, that you would understand and experience and encounter God's love for you, made known through Jesus Christ, who loved you, who gave himself for you. 
who died in your place, who bore your sin, who rose from the dead, and who offers you forgiveness and eternal life, who offers you His compassion and His grace, His kindness forever and ever. That your heart would resonate with His love and that it would lead you to a life of worship. That you would also reciprocate His hased. That you would live a life of hased. That your life would be a demonstration of one who's experienced God's love and now that you're able to live a life of love, sharing that love with others, Right? And so that's my prayer and my heart for each of you. And this morning, I, I, I just I wanted us to be able to see this amazing love of God and understand it maybe in a little bit better way. And so we're going to look briefly at the book of Hosea and then connect it with a passage in the Gospel of Luke. And so let's, let's consider, first of all, the, this prophet Hosea. He is called by God to prophesy in a time where Israel... Uh, is divided for 200 years now. They've been two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And Hosea is called to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom of Israel has a, a really oblique history. Because throughout their history, they never have a godly king. They never have a king who does what God designed a king to do. To be a shepherd to his people. And to be a shepherd to his people meant not only did he lead them politically, but that he would lead them spiritually. That he would lead them to know God. That he would lead them to obey God. And to keep the covenant that God had made with them. But that hasn't happened. And it's been 200 years. And just as, just as an extraordinary thought, because God is what we, we encounter, that he is incredibly, what, patient. He's slow to anger. And God is patient with you. And God is patient with me. But sometimes we might be tempted to think that God's patience is indifference. Say, you know what? I've kind of wandered into some sin. But you know what? My life's still pretty good. God still seems to be blessing. Everything, I'm still experiencing success. Nothing bad's happened to me. My teeth haven't fallen out. Are you with me? And you think, maybe God's in, maybe, maybe I can get away with this. It doesn't matter. But God's patience is not his indifference. God is just. Right? We saw that all the way back on Monday when we looked at Exodus chapter 34. Yes, he's compassionate. The first thing he describes himself as. He's merciful. He is patient. He abounds in hesed. He maintains it for a thousand generations. He forgives sin, but he's also just. And so the, the book of Hosea brings us to a scene where God raises this man Hosea up to be a prophet, to be a voice, to be a warning, to call the people back to obedience to God. And God is going to ask Hosea to do something unthinkable. Because not only is he going to ask Hosea to preach a hard message, but he's going to ask him to do something to visibly portray Israel's sin. You know, God has a plan for your life. It's something I'm passionate about helping people understand because I know there are people that struggle to believe that sometimes. Does God have a plan for my life? Yes, he does. And God does have a good plan for your life. But that does not mean it will always be an easy plan. That does not mean it will always be a plan that lines up with what you think is good for your life. And the prophet Hosea, God is going to come to him and he says, I want you to marry a woman who will be unfaithful to you. We are not certain, but she's either already a prostitute, she's already an immoral woman, or she will be one after they're married. But either way, it is clear to Hosea, I want you to marry someone who's going to be unfaithful to you. And I don't know about you, but I, how, how, I imagine how Hosea, you know, you know, what's running through his mind. You know, God, God, I have, God says, i got a great plan for your life. Yes, Lord, I want you to preach. Yes, I'll do it. It's going to be hard. I'll do it, Lord. People aren't going to listen. I'll do it anyway. If you want me to do it, I'll do it. And Hosea, I want you to get married. Yes, I always wanted to get married. Didn't think anyone would like me. I don't know if maybe he wasn't unattractive, whatever. But I want you to marry, okay, I want you to marry a prostitute, and she's going to be unfaithful to you. And you're like, Come again, Lord? Like, is that really necessary? Yes. Why? Because God had always wanted marriage to be a picture, to be a reflection of his relationship with his people, of his loyal and faithful and steadfast love. And now his people, 
They have rejected him constantly. And yet in the book of Hosea, we'll see that the people there, in many ways, are still going through the formalities of worship. They're still, sa- they're still offering sacrifices. They're, they're going to sing time, and they're singing the hymns, even robustly. But they're not living out the truth of them. They're not walking in obedience to God. They're not living a life of loving God through seeking to know Him and obey Him. In fact, exactly the opposite. The king, Jeroboam, who's the king when, when, when Hosea begins his ministry, he's, he's a successful man. He, he's a, a great political leader, economic leader, but he absolutely fails as a spiritual leader. And so... God asked Hosea to marry a woman. Notice what, let's just, we're going to just look at a few select passages throughout the book just to give you a a bit of an understanding of this. But look at Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. It says, when the Lord first spoke to Hosea, the Lord said to him, go and take a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. And and that's, that's a really intense and graphic picture. But you know, when People haven't been paying attention for a long time. God recognizes he's willing to do anything to get their attention. And so it said he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, which means scattered. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. She conceived, look down at verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to her, call her name, no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by the bow or the sword or the war or by horses or by horsemen. When she weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. We'd all step back and say, wow, this is, this is all really intense, isn't it? Right, marry a prostitute who's going to be unfaithful, and then he does that, they have children. He says, your first son, name him, God's going to scatter his people, and then you have a daughter, and you say, let's call her no mercy. I, I can't imagine her first day at kindergarten. Are you with me? Everyone's going around, what's your name? My name's no mercy. <laughs> Everyone's like, okay, calm down. Not my people. I will not be your God. These are stinging words. But then notice verse 10. It's almost, you know, we've talked about laments in the Psalms, about how people offer laments to God. But here's God in himself lamenting. He says, yet the number of children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint themselves one head and they shall go up to the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. You see, God is just and he, 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 he will always and must punish sin right? because it, he is a just God. He cannot overlook sin. But God's heart, God's desire is to be compassionate and it's to forgive and it's to heal and to restore and even in this incredible time where God is announcing his judgment and using the prophet Hosea to vividly portray that, to not only preach a message that he knew wouldn't be listened to, but to portray it through his own marriage. And so God is a God of justice, but he is also a God of compassion. And he is a God who desires mercy. And so he uses the prophet Hosea to not only warn the people, but to show this incredible picture. Look at, look at chapter, the end of chapter 2 going into chapter 3. Beginning in verse 18, or verse 19. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. Right? Here's this wedding language. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love. There's our word, chesed. And in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, and I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer with grain and the wine and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel, and I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. 
and he shall say, you are my God. As you read and study the book of Hosea, over and over again, there will be very vivid and very stern and graphic warnings of God's justice and God's judgment. But woven throughout all of them is this heart of God's hesed, that he is a God who's compassionate, that he's gracious, that he's patient, that he wants to offer his unfailing love to his people, and he's going to do something. Right, God has made promises to Abraham that through you, right, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And God keeps his promises. God made promises to David. Someone will sit on your throne forever. And God keeps his promises, even though his people are constantly unfaithful. Because here's the thing, God's chesed, his loving kindness, his faithfulness, is not dependent on us. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that God's loyal love isn't dependent on your performance, on your obedience? It's who he is and what he offers to us. And in chapter 3, it's graphically pictured. Notice chapter 3. The Lord said to me, now Hosea is speaking. He says, the Lord said to me, go again and love a woman who is loved by another man. That's his wife, Gomer, and is an adulteress. She's left him. And he says, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. What a graphic. He says, Hosea, I want you to go and find your wayward, unfaithful wife. And I want you to bring her back to yourself. And I want you to love her even as the Lord loves his people, the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love the cakes of raisins, a reference to their sin and their, the, the, the depth of their sin. He says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lecheth of barley. Right? He had to actually purchase his wife back. And he said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days and you shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So I also will be to you. He says, you need to be faithful to me. I will be faithful to you. God is a God of relentless love and relentless pursuit of his people. Chapter 4 says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. For there's no faithfulness or chesed, no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing of adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Verse 3 says, The land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. Right? We get the picture. Do you see it? Do you, do you understand? He says, he says that my people, they have no chesed. They're not in any way resonating with my love for them. They're not reciprocating my faithful love that I pour out on them day after day that I offer to them over and over. It's just a reminder of how fragile and frail our love is. He says later in verse 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, and I reject you from being a priest. I want you to go over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, it says, come, let us return to the Lord. This is chapter 6, verse 1. For he has torn us that he may heal us. Right, when God wounds, when God allows hardship or difficulty, it's always for a purpose, it's always for a reason, it's never random, it's never for nothing. And here is Hosea preaching this message. Come, he says, let us return to the Lord. Right? We've forsaken him. We have totally put him off. We have been unfaithful. He has wounded us. He's torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So let us know and let us press on to know the Lord. For his going out is as sure as the dawn. And he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. In, in verse 4, there's this lament again about their lack of chesed. He says, your love is like the morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. And then verse 6, which is a verse, if you're here next week, that we're going to touch. Because next week we're going to be in the New Testament, looking at the same word. Although it won't be there explicitly but we will see it implicitly throughout the New Testament, throughout the life of Jesus, throughout 
the Gospels. But Hosea chapter 6 says, For I desire what? Chesed. This is, he says, God says, I desire chesed, not sacrifice, not your performance, not all, the, all those things, they're, they're there, but that's not what I want most. I don't want you to just go through the motions. It's not just about doing the things or doing the rituals. He says, I desire chesed not sacrifice, the knowledge of God. And this knowledge is not a word that would describe just knowing about, but actually deeply knowing, knowing him. I'd rather you know me than offer burnt offerings. You're missing the point is what he's saying. And so there's this invitation over and over again as we would go through this this story, as we go through the book of Hosea, the, the warnings, the judgments, The pronouncements keep coming, and they are there to call God's people to attention, but they constantly don't listen. Then we come to chapter 11, so I want you to fast forward to chapter 11. And I know we're we're doing the most extreme and limited flyover, and so I'd invite you at some point to go back and and read through this whole book. But chapter 11 is an extraordinary chapter, because here God expresses his, his emotion. He expresses his love, his heart. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. And Ephraim here is symbolic of Israel, the northern kingdom. He said, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness with the bands of love. I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. What amazing, tender language. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. He's lamenting the judgment that even he will have to bring on them. The sword shall rage against their cities and consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own counsels. And this would happen soon after Hosea's prophecy, soon after he speaks these words, Assyria will come, 722, and destroy the nation of Israel. He says, my people are bent on turning away from me, verse 7. Though they call out to the Most High, they're going through the motions. They sing the songs, but they're not living and it's not resonating in their heart. He shall not raise them up. But then he laments, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adama? How can I treat you like Zeboim? For my heart recoils within me. Think about it. God says, my heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath. Can you see, can you feel, can you understand the depth of God's love even in his judgments? Go to, go to chapter 14. After more pronouncements of judgment, here's the, 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 the last chapter, the, the message of, of Hosea. He says, return, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good. We will pay with bulls and the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. And we will say no more our God to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. And he shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall shall spread out, and his beauty shall be like the olive. His fragrance like Lebanon. And they shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like the evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Right? One of the big issues of the day was that the people were trusting idols. They were trusting their military strength. They were trusting everything and anything but God. And yet God calls after them over and over again. He pictures graphically through the prophet Hosea this extraordinary, incredible love. How relentless his love is, even though they've been unfaithful. 
he takes them and he offers them an invitation. And then there's one last verse. And this last verse of Hosea is extraordinary because it helps us realize that this message wasn't just a message of a prophet thousands of years ago. It wasn't just a one-time message to a people, but it was a message for the people of God in every generation, a warning to you and to me and to all of us. And he says this, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright will walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. He says, if you're wise, you'll pay attention. If you're discerning, you'll listen. And you'll understand that there is a God who is just. But he is compassionate and he is loving. He offers you grace and he offers you mercy. And he offers you, instead of living a life of sin. And, you know, we talked about, you know, being satisfied yesterday in the morning, right, with God's chesed. Realizing that it's God who satisfies me. But, you know, the temptations of sin are so enticing. And it's easy to be deceived and think, it's sin, it's rebellion, it's doing what I want, it's doing what's right in my eyes. That will satisfy me. That will fulfill me. That's the thing. It's easy. Listen, smarter people than you have done really stupid things. Right? You, you need to grasp this. People that are far smarter than I am, and I, I know all of, all of you are incredibly intelligent. Very intelligent. Many of you are very wise for your age. Man, I, I am blown away by hearing your testimonies, hearing the depth of the, the richness of your walk with God and the insights. It's incredible. It encourages me so much. And I love being here. Right? I love being here not just to speak in chapel, not just to play Frisbee, I, I love being here because I love getting to see what God is doing in your life. I love coming to sing time. And last night as you sang, Because He Lives, that last verse, I, I couldn't even sing it. I just had to listen. Man, it just, my heart resonated with your worship and it encouraged me so much. So I know so many of you love God. You're, you're smart. You're wise for your years. But don't think, don't think that you're immune to temptation. Don't think that you're immune to sin. And the wages of sin really is death. Now, if you're in Christ, it's not eternal death. It's not eternal condemnation. You never have to fear that. You never have to worry about that. But there is always a cost in this life to our sin. And here Hosea says, whoever's wise, let him understand these things. Whoever's discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. In Luke chapter 7, there's an amazing, amazing story. And I'm just going to very, very briefly share it with you. But it's a really incredible picture because we're never, never given the indication that Gomer ever really changed her heart. Right? There's no indication that, that even after Hosea purchases her and brings her back that there was any actual change of her heart. But there was a woman in Jesus' day a sinful woman, most likely a prostitute. And yet she's heard. She's heard something she's never heard before. Maybe through the preaching of John the Baptist. Maybe from Jesus' very own lips as he taught. But she's heard that there is a God who forgives sin. That there is a God who loves and who cares. And something has resonated in her heart. And one day when Jesus is eating a meal with some Pharisees, she comes and it says in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, Behold, a woman of the city was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet and weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And all of these things were symbolic of, of customary things that should have been done for Jesus when he came to dinner house they were to offer to wash your feet because your feet were gross and nasty and in that day you reclined around a table so your feet were next to somebody's what face, face. thank you right so if your feet if somebody else's feet are next to your face you'd really appreciate it if they what they'd wash them you were supposed to offer oil to anoint their head you're supposed to give them a kiss of greeting they've done none of this but this woman is doing this in this lavish and over-the-top way and it says the pharisee who invited him saw this and he said he thinks to himself, in his, in his mind, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this was and what sort of woman who's touching him. For she's a sinner. Right? All he could see is a sinner. And Jesus, discerning his thoughts, 
right, asks him some questions. And he says, I, I've got a question for you. And I'm sure he's like, ha, you got a question for me? You ought to be questioning her. And he shares a story about forgiveness. And then he rebukes him. He said, you gave me no kiss. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. But this woman has done all of that. And he says, he says therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Right? This woman, though her sin was great, found that there was a God who forgives and a God who changes and a God who gives new life. There's a few things that I've been praying for you. And I want to share them with you as we close. Number one, I've been praying that the first thing that you think about when you think about God is the truth of who he is. Psalm 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in chesed. It's my prayer that when you think about God, you will think about the truth of who he is. Number two, it's my prayer that you will not just think about that, but that you will experience the truth of who God is. I don't want you to just know about God, but I want you to actually know him, to taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the one who takes refuge in him, that you would be able to know God as your dwelling place, that you would be able to lament before him in the seasons of darkness and difficulty, that you would be able to rejoice in his goodness and his joy in your life, that you would be able to deeply know his love and experience it and to continually find your hope in him. My third prayer is that you would live a life that resonates in worship. You were made to be a worshiper. You were created to be a worshiper. And when you experience God's extraordinary love, our lives should resonate in worship. Psalm 63, verse 3 says, My lips will glorify you because your chesed is better than life. My fourth prayer for you is that you will live a life that reciprocates, reciprocates God's chesed. Right? God doesn't want us to just know about him. He wants us to know him and experience him deeply. He doesn't want us to just experience him deeply, but he wants our lives to be changed and that we are to be ambassadors of God's love and his grace of the gospel. And so I pray that you will live a life that reciprocates. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 that God is kind to the undeserving. We all have people in our life that we say, man, they're not very deserving. They're the very people that we say, how can I show God's unconditional love to them? How can I demonstrate that to them? And then fifthly, my prayer for you is that you will be able to proclaim each day that God is good. My prayer for you is that you'd be able to wake up every day and be able to say, God is good. And his has said, his loving kindness, his faithful, his covenant love, his indescribable love endures forever. That's my prayer, that you would live a life marked by this incredible reality of who God is and that you would live for his glory alone. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, I, I know that in this limited time, that very inadequately have we even begun to touch it. But Father, I pray from this message of the prophet Hosea, from his very life, his willingness to demonstrate your love through his marriage of unfaithfulness. And yet you are faithful and you reach out to us over and over and over again. Father, I pray that we would be those who take the warning of Hosea, that we would be wise, that we would listen. And Father, I pray that everyone here, everyone listening to this message, would be, receive your love for them through Christ. And that our heart would resonate with your love and live a life of worship and that they would reciprocate your love by living a life for your glory and for your purposes. And I ask this in Jesus' name.